considerations for clinical AI. Uh, I'm Sharon, as you've probably met before if you've seen our other episodes, um, and I will be moderating our panel today. Uh, so we'll be discussing lots of you know, venture considerations if you're starting your own company, um, all sorts of things here you can get uh, from our expert panel and feel free to pop questions in during the live session. Uh, and so maybe we'll go around for a round of introductions first. Uh, Sarah, would you like to start? Yes, I'm Sarah Karouche, Chief Strategy Officer at Chiron Medical, based in London. We've de developed AI for breast screening. And before that, I was in Silicon Valley for 20 years and um, I've done a lot of fundraising in my time. And um, it's one of my passions is helping companies get the money they need to get traction. Very cool. Francesco? Hey all, I am Francisco Jimenez. I'm a partner at 8VC, which is a tech venture capital firm, uh, kind of distributed between San Francisco, Austin, and Boston. Uh, we have about 3.5 billion assets under management, investing out of a current fund of 640 million. And about 40% of our fund covers bio and health IT from you know, life sciences of like traditional therapeutics discovery all the way through uh, healthcare services and next-gen healthcare delivery. Very cool, thank you. I hope you uh, invested in GameStop. No. Um, <laughs> Amir, would you like to go next? Good thing. Uh, my name is Amir Sandhu. I'm a venture capitalist at the Blue Cross Blue Shield Venture Fund. Um, so we work closely with um, 34 out of the 36 blue plans um, and, and across those plans, uh, they, they cover about 100 million lives um, in the States. Um, and so our fund is about $820 million and we've uh, invested in probably about half a dozen uh, imaging and AI heavy companies um, like Heartflow and Perspective and Thrive are some good examples. But I'm also a radiologist. I'm a proud alum of Stanford's radiology program where I um, trained under Kurt um, and Matt and, and others, uh, and I continue to practice um, as adjunct faculty in the department. Fantastic. We can't have Matt here today, but we all, we all miss him. <laughs> all right, Kevin, you're next. It's great to see Terrific. you. Uh, so we did not invest in GameStop. I'll start there. <laughs> so Bummer. My name's Kevin Lalonde. I'm one of the founding managing directors of Sante. Uh, Sante is a healthcare and life science venture capital fund, uh, and we have a separate strategy, which is a machine learning driven systematic public fund. So we actually do both. Uh, we have about $800 million under management. Uh, the firm itself is 15 years old, and we have offices in Austin and Boston. Lots of Austin and Boston going on, <laughs> also with ABC. Uh, Kevin and I actually met at a uh, at the deep learning poster session for CS230 way back when, um, and very cool. So Kevin does also know deep learning. He doesn't he doesn't advertise that. Uh, Nina, would you like to go next? Sure. Hello, everyone. Uh, like Amir, I am also a practicing radiologist and I'm the Associate Chief Medical Officer for Artificial Intelligence at Radiology Partners, which is a, a private radiology practice. And I don't have any VC or, or financial background, but I do have a lot of background in terms of so just making decisions about AI and working with different vendors and trying to figure out what a business case would be and, and learning about it through the industry. Thank you and welcome back, Nina. Judy? Hey everyone, my name is uh, Judy Gichaya. I'm an interventional radiologist and um, my role, I have zero VC <laughs> funding or knowledge. But, and working in an academic center, really, uh, I see our role as being very poor in terms of product development, but very strong in terms of conducting clinical trials and validation. So I see my role in the ecosystem as lowering the barrier for people to test and validate the algorithms in close to real world practice, which is really also my passion. Thank you so much, Judy. And last but not least, Kurt. Ah, thanks, Sharon. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I'm Kurt Langlotz. I am a practicing radiologist also and director of the Center for AI and Medicine and Imaging, which is sponsoring this uh, live session today. I guess also relevant to this group is I've 
founded and advised several small companies over uh, many years. And some of those have received venture capital. Some of those have tried and haven't, and some of them have not ever tried. And uh, so uh, no VC experience per se, but uh, a lot of thinking about the market. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kurt. You've got quite the distribution there going. Um, all right. So uh, we'll start off by, you know, a few questions uh, that I have, but feel free, again, audience uh, or panelists to take it in whatever direction you're interested in. Um, but I thought there were some, you know, spicy, true, false uh, questions that we could start off with that I, I personally am also interested to hear your opinions on. So the first true, false question or statement here is healthcare startups require a lot of upfront capital to get started. True or false? Anyone? I can start with a quick answer. Sure. <laughs> you know, like uh, the, the technology for uh, a lot of the things that we could do in healthcare, uh, whether it is artificial intelligence or creating applications, there's not a huge barrier to entry. The cost of actually creating an algorithm or a product May, it is probably not that high. And so in that way, you don't need to have a huge amount of capital, but in order to be successful, that's a different question. Um, I think you need to get the involvement of people that are in the industry and working with physicians uh, is not inexpensive, <laughs> let's say, uh, trying to gain the physician's time and be able to cross problems where a lot of the issues that you're trying to solve is because all of our data is isolated in different segments, you end up having to create a huge amount of external things that are unrelated to your actual application that I think end up costing the vast amount of, of dollars. And the cost of clinical trials. So when you're doing developing an algorithm, the cost of actually testing it um, can be really expensive and obviously take years. So I, I just wanted to say to Judy, we've actually just signed up with Emory to do one of our large scale clinical trials with you. Yes, uh, we're super excited about this. So, I mean, um, I think one of the bigger things, uh, sort of someone who, um, you know, is that like sort of our lessons and our preparation to this is, um, uh, you know, I think there's also a political cost, right? Trying to figure out how are you going to get access to the, you know, the images, uh, you know, how are you going? Because this is no longer that your friend is asking for data, you know, like, oh, I have this machine learning project. Could you send me some x-rays? You know, I go through the RB. So this requires data use agreements that you have to go through the enterprise, which are not skills that we're really taught as you know, I wasn't taught in these skills and I've, we've had to figure out and standardize that process for us, you know, and then overcoming the barriers, for example, where the enterprise itself is saying, you know, you know, what's in it for us, our data is valuable. I think that f fact has moved on because maybe curated data is more valuable, more than just saying holding on your data is valuable. And then also that I don't expect, you know, Chiron to come up and say, these are our timelines and, you know, and then you'll be coming up with excuses of like, oh, you know, my server is slow or something like that, or you're trying to balance clinical time. So there's a lot of uh, what I would call sort of soft skills that are required on the, maybe not the, 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 the partner that you're looking into that may not necessarily have a cost dollar attached to it, but, uh, and also even in academic partnerships, they also have indirect, you know, and how to figure out that also adds onto your cost. So, um, I mean, that's been our experience uh, with Chiron and, you know, hopefully, you know, we have everything in place for a sort of a stable timeline, uh, but it's very different from academia where you may just work on a project for close to two years. That's not the luxury that industry, you know, approaches as well. And so you can I imagine as a venture firm, this is a question uh, that is of burning interest to us. And the good news is there's actually, there's also data. Um, so if you take the 2200 United States uh, venture-backed healthcare exits from 2000 to today, so over the last 20 years, what you would find is the mean company raised about $80 million. But if you look at it, it looks like the uniform function. And if you were to plot um, capital raised, against exit value, it looks like somebody hit the side of a barn with a shotgun 
right? So the correlation wouldn't, wouldn't hold water in any other experiment. So what we found is there are situations where you're able to start a forest fire with a single match. Uh, and then there's other places where you would have to back up a tanker truck full of gasoline to get it to burn. And so knowing those, they tend to be a little bit idiosyncratic, right? Clearly um, biotech drug development tends to be the most capital intensive, but you can find repurposed molecules uh, that have large safety dossiers. Uh, you can find advantage regulatory pathways. Um, you can find non-dilutive capital. And so there are situations that require less money, even in places that are very capital intensive. And Sharon, my, my answer to that would be generally false. Um, I think there are exceptions where you know some sort of a consumer application could uh, spread rapidly or something that's had extensive work and testing in an academic laboratory where it really was product ready. Um, but generally, I think it does require more resources, at least in the area that I know best, which is radiology IT. And that's because in radiology AI, because you have the need for data to train these algorithms. That's not simple for a startup. Uh, you have the uh, long sales cycles, trying to get your technology into hospitals and health systems, which is very different uh, in many ways than other markets, I guess similar to some B2B markets, but, but it takes, takes a long time. Uh, so those are some of the, the factors I think that, that tend to slow down these companies. Yeah, I, I think, um, so I, I really agree with what Kevin and Kurt just mentioned. Uh, the conventional wisdom here is probably yes, but it, it's not always true. There are good examples where you don't necessarily need um, a, a ton of capital. And, and then the word I would kind of key in here on is upfront. Um, and actually had a really um, interesting meeting with, with an investor um, who seeded companies like Zoom, Twitter, uh, Color Genomics, and then a whole host of others. Um, and what was really interesting is, is a big part of the strategy that, that he employed was um, seeding these companies, keeping the burn rate low until you find some product market fit, and then you ramp. Um, that is a little harder to do, admittedly, um, on the life science side, but there are areas in healthcare where you can employ that strategy. The product market fit is a tough one because it's on the vendor to prove that they that their use case drives value. And, um, and for us, that means that's improvement in patient outcomes. And it takes a lot of sort of wrangling of data and a long time in order to be able to do that. You know, CMS is working really hard to try and get groups that can prove value, drive outcomes, but it's hard to gather that data that show that. And I probably agree, especially with the notion, with everything said here actually, uh, to semantically pick apart the sentence, I think upfront is, is um, as Emer said, the, the important thing. I think you can seed these companies to get the POC uh, and then actually prove stuff out and raise subsequent capital. I think you kind of, you know, do have to have an executive team with the ability to raise, say, a hundred million dollars over the lifetime of a company. It doesn't mean you have to, but we view that as a huge risk to the company if we just don't think they could do that. And so, you know, whatever you want to call it, the reality distortion field of a founder. But if they come in, they've got a great technology and we're like, you can raise 1 million, but you can't raise 50. It's, it's a concern because we actually do need to account for that in the future of the company. So over the lifetime, there possibly is a lot of capital. And at the very least, the team needs to have that ability to do so. Great, well, thank you everyone. It sounds like everyone more or less agrees with each other. We will see if that changes throughout this episode. Um, so the second true false question is, drug discovery startups are just targets for acquisition. Um, and maybe it's not true or false, it's more like, what is your reaction to a statement like that? Uh, and is there another play here that people aren't seeing um, that these companies could, could go after? Um, I'm happy to dive in here. I think the standard M&A model, right, is really what's considered an exit. So even an IPO frequently, it's insiders buying in and waiting to get exit to pharma. So. I think that's the reality of a drug discovery startup. 
Um, there's the asterisk I'd put on that is when we're looking at these completely novel modalities of drugs uh, that you actually have to build up all the enabling infrastructure. There's an argument to be made that you could be, you know, a self-sufficient pharma. And if you talk to the founders of Juno and Kite, they both believed they were going to go to the distance and do it themselves. And then the offers just came in and, you know, it was, it was a trade-off decision. Uh, but I think a lot of these novel modalities and technologies are, are, are hopefully building out the next gen pharmas, not just next gen biotechs. The other play that people try to say that I don't know if I agree with is partnership focused models. So everybody, it's almost like a negative signal when somebody tries to pitch me like the Nimbus Nash spin out type model um, or some kind of bridge bio thing. Like those are great examples, but, or Adam out for example, but I think broadly it's, you have to have a product. You can't hope to throw molecules over the fence and make money from it in the future. I think one of the challenges that discovery companies sometimes face is to build that product, you often need very different competencies than in the original discovery part, especially if it's, if it's or tech enabled discovery, uh, but they're often different therapeutic areas, different clinical teams are required. So building a single company is enough work building companies in completely different TAs all under one roof as, as a startup, that's tough. And I think that's why they often end up trying to license or partner, but it's challenging. And I think, um, I mean, I personally think that the big companies tend to be very, very, they're great because they have relationships and they, they can access. When I look at a big company come to Emory that we use uh, the equipment with, it's very easy for them to, you know, go to the, you know, the C-suite and get things done and get maybe commitment for, you know, let's get a live feed more than small companies. But I find them very uh, rigid to ideas and innovation and trying to be, you know, very value focused. So like Nina said, if, if we are strictly thinking, maybe not drug development or device development, like a new modality, if you're thinking about an AI company, you know, I, I don't see how a 10, you know, like, like, you know, when you're raise, able to raise this amount of money, I mean, what are you gonna sell to be honest that has that much value? And maybe I'm just coming from a pessimistic view, but you can't sell me a new radiograph thing and that you invested 10 million in. I, I mean, that's, I just don't see the value in that. So it has to be something that is embedded either in a clinical care or, you know, a package because that's how reimbursement is tied. And so in those ones, you can only be acquired or your technology is sold to another company that is already a big player, but the comp big companies are very rigid to innovation. And this is, I mean, by the time they go through their life cycle, we'll have new technology to replace those things. That, that's my opinion, it may be controversial, but, that's, that's how I feel. Maybe to speak to that in, in radiology, I think, and this, is, this may be controversial as well, but you can apply that to the, the typical PAX companies that PAX was, was innovative, what, uh, 40 years ago. I would say now it's very big and they have the market. And now there's new companies that are AI companies that are coming out and re-innovating what PAX did. They're much more innovative, but it's harder for them to get into the market, which is really owned by the big company. And so what is the business case? How does it break through? How do you combine those two so that we in healthcare can get the value from innovation, but applied in a way that we can actually use it? Right, so it sounds like because everything is so integrated, it's hard to be a small player and it's tempting both because of that, because of the relationships, as well as because as Francisco mentioned, it's tempting um, in terms of money offers, uh, since the big players have so much of that, so much capital to just throw at uh, acquiring someone um, that these that we don't see as many independent startups uh, in this space um, go through the the full length of the full length of I guess towards IPO. Um, all yeah, right, Sharon, I, I'd I'd extend on that a little bit, which is to say, if you're if you're going to be a startup, by definition, you're the attacker, not the incumbent. 
right? So what you don't have is an ongoing business to cover overhead and expenses and all of your corporate functions and everything else. Um, that's the disadvantage. The advantage uh, to what Judy was saying is, is you can be incredibly focused and nimble to new ideas or disruptive ideas. But I, I think it's important to have clarity about what exactly the startup does that's differentiated from anything else. Within the context of healthcare life science, uh, you know, we find those are best anchored in clinical value. You know, a, a very clear unmet medical need um, where the medical economics, even if they're not currently reimbursed, um, if payers and insurers sort of had the full package, they ought to reimburse it, right? Because, you know, you, your point earlier, sometimes it takes a lot of time and a lot of data to convince them. But it's that, it's that one single focus. And so back to your, your drug discovery, every one of those drugs is a different proposition, right? Um, even if the chemistry or the MOA is similar, the, the therapeutic area or the, the economic arrangement could be completely different. And so there, it's tough to build in a startup something that has multiple sort of independent product lines within it. It can be done, but it's hard. And I think this dovetails nicely to another question for our aspiring entrepreneurs. And that's if they are a startup or a few individuals right now looking to raise money in healthcare AI, what's the most important piece to get right? What are red flags? What are green flags that you've seen? Or any anecdotes would be cool too. I've seen a lot of, of vendors come to us in, in a private practice where they're looking to kind of get us to partner with them in something in radiology. And, and some of the red flags that I see are creating a solution because you have access to the data. That's not a solution that I need. Mm -hmm. You really have to flip that discussion. And, um, and while it's easier to go after, Hey, here's what I think radiologists do, which is just read, just do image detection. And I have access to images. So I'm going to create an image detection algorithm. You really have to spend the time working with the, the people that you're selling to and figuring out what do they actually need. And that means getting, uh, taking the investment early on to partner with the downstream users. Yeah, yeah and I, I, I agree with that. And I th some of the red flags I've seen is, uh, or I just think it's really important to learn the healthcare business before you learn the health IT business or the health AI business. Healthcare is incredibly complicated. And so uh, a lot of smart people have been defeated by trying to enter the healthcare business without really getting an understanding or at least having advisors that, that understand it. Um, also the importance of clinical expertise. This is maybe an apocryphal story, but something that I've heard uh, repeated a couple of times is uh, a, a company demonstrating an AI algorithm that labeled the lumbar spine in terms of the levels, the lumbar levels. And the person hearing the demo said, well, what do you do about transitional vertebral bodies? And the person giving the demo said, what's a transitional, what's a transitional vertebral body? So that to me, you know, highlights the importance of clinical expertise. And so, you know, increasingly, I think we're seeing founders who have that, or at least know that they need to get that kind of uh, expertise. And then the last one is, uh, understanding how to sell to hospitals. And we talked about the long sales cycle. I think the other principle that often applies is free is not free. You know, a lot of companies approach hospitals and say, well, well, we'll give this to you in return for you piloting it. But the costs of just uh, installing that and maintaining it still are incurred by the, the hospital. Uh, so understanding those dynamics and being able to navigate those, I think are incredibly important as well. Yeah, I agree. And I think at a very fundamental level, you know, you can ask two questions when you, when you see a new service or company, um, does the product do what you say it can do? And then secondly, uh, does someone care enough about that, that about the problem that they're willing to buy this product? Um, and, and a lot of times, you know, that second question is what trips people up. And when, you know, Kurt just mentioned, uh, understanding how to sell to hospitals. But I think another red flag that we've seen a lot in, in healthcare AI is 
um, understanding how a payer might view this product. And, and that's been a big gap. Um, and, you know, frankly, you know, I came over from the, from the clinical side to a venture fund, which is very, works very closely with payers. And it's, it's been really enlightening to see how payers evaluate these solutions. But I guess if, if I were to, to give a piece of advice to companies in this realm, it's that understanding that who pays for this product can often be very different than who might use it. And you have to keep all of the parties in that ecosystem happy and you have to give them a reason to, to use it to buy the product. Yeah, values in the eye of the beholder. Um, right. and, and there's value, different people. Actually, the first AI vendor that ever came to our practice and tried to sell us on something, their sales pitch was, we're going to replace radiologists. And I was like, you realize that we're radiology practice. Like, that is not what we want. <laughs> like, think about who you're selling to. And there is, like, there is different value for different people. Talk to me about efficiency. Talk to me, I don't know, about uh, improving quality at, at the same time as I'm able to do that with, with less people. But um, the, the other thing that, that's really stood out to me, and I think people get this wrong all the time, is they talk about what their accuracy is and, and their ROC and mine's better than theirs. You know what? I actually think that these products are not, um, they're, they're going to become a commodity the algorithm itself is going to become a commodity. And I'm looking for a partner. I'm looking for someone who's willing to help me solve my problems. Like when you're in med school, do your rotations. The people that do best on the surgical rotations are the ones that figure out how to be helpful without being told. And, and in my exploration and working with different vendors, there's some that are really great at that. And they're helping me solve my problems and they're actively coming in to do that. And there are others that just wanna sell me a product. The thing I'd add here, because, you know, I think the standard thing is like workflow, value to the physician, value to the patient. How does a payer want to reimburse this? Um, maybe just broadly in the investment side of things, though, I think um, understanding market size for exactly what you're doing, because there's a lot of really amazing workflow optimizations that I think people would pay for, but can't really move the needle for a venture fund. So, you know, example I like to think of is, is um, my old uh, PI was um, Daniel Rubin and somebody was asking him, what's, what's the best kind of workflow optimization we can do? And he's talking about all this like next gen AI reporting, whatever stuff. And they're like, no, but like, what's a near term one? He's like, I guess you could just optimize hanging protocols. That'd be the easiest thing uh, that would like make everybody's life better. And it's true. Optimizing hanging protocols is huge. Uh, and I don't know how you could possibly get somebody to pay enough money to justify a startup in that area. It's got to be incorporated into this whole suite of tools. And I think it's, it's a frustrating thing, but it's, uh, it's an important thing to remember is, is what is the market for this thing uh, that you're trying to solve for. I actually love that solution. The, the backend uses of AI are the absolute best uses. And I think that people would pay a lot of money to figure out, let's use the image detection tool, not to just help me detect a finding, but to identify the series and study so that I can then route them appropriately. I can make the hanging protocol come up every time, you know, by using computer vision rather than trying to map whatever a exam is to a master procedure list. That backend stuff is not sexy, but I would pay way more for that than I would pay for a detection algorithm doing yeah. one. The best things, the best use cases I've seen for AI is giving the computer context, not to replace the physician's job but to actually give the computer context to actually be, create better user interfaces and better user experiences, such as that hanging protocol. Give me context where I'm in the body. Can you imagine opening a you know, thousand image CT slide and being able to control F liver is like kind of a nifty thing to do if we know that it's routed in and we need to look at the liver. And the problem is like, can you sell something like that? Can you even integrate a solution like that into an existing workstation? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but those are the huge value adds, I think, when you look at uh, this, or at least in radiology that I see. And Francisco, I, I agree with you on the barriers to entry to some of those because we're working with these very large entrenched uh, software applications and we're talking about make, maybe making modifications to them that a startup is not gonna really be viable in that space. 
Um, but I think there are also, there is potentially some swing for the fences, bigger opportunities. If you look at just the intersection of cloud, um, AI, uh, HTML5 viewers and speech recognition and putting those all together to essentially just disrupt the current radiologist desktop, which is incredibly chaotic. You typically have, yeah. we've got three or four things all running at the same time. They don't work together very well, but if you could come up with a really nice UI user experience for the radiologist that involved some help from AI and was kind of available anywhere through the cloud, that would be incredibly powerful. And I'd love yeah. to hear Sarah, your point of view on this. Um, Cause I saw that recently Chiron, you had a, a fortune article about your breath screening AI that complements the skills of radiologists. What are your thoughts on, on essentially building these complementary tools with? Well, I think great comments from everybody so far. I think for us, finding that exact right value proposition in the context of workflow has been fundamental to the progress we've made. So in our case, breast screening radiology, detecting, um, detecting breast cancer. And in the context in the UK where we started, um, there's two um, radiologists that read every mammogram. And then if they disagree, it's arbitrated by a third person. So that's a perfect use case for AI because there's a workforce crisis, there's a backlog of women needing to be screened now, 1.5 million in the UK alone because of COVID. We're never gonna catch up. So if we can get AI and Mia specifically as that second reader, and then if they disagree with, if Mia disagrees with the radiologist, then it's arbitrated by a human reader. I think that's the kind of use case. And we're seeing tremendous lift and support from, from the UK government, for example, who just um, supported us to deploy to 15 hospitals. Um, so I think that's really key, getting that, value proposition, but in the context of workflow is really fundamental. The other thing I think that's really, really important that we haven't talked about is generalizability. It's one thing to have performance in a lab. It's a whole other thing getting it into clinical practice and making sure it's safe for a broad population, which is one of the reasons we're working with Emory. It's inclusion. Let's make sure that we're developing these technologies for the broad population and not just a, a subset. And I think that I want to highlight something to, I think Sarah is emphasizing too, and that is we talk a lot about, well, will AI replace radiologists? And I think we know that in diagnostic radiology, just because you can detect pneumonia doesn't mean you're going to replace a chest radiologist. There's just so much else going on there. But I think one area where uh, AI can pick up the slack and will maybe have some workforce implications is in screening. And I think that you know what we're talking about is this second reader phenomenon in Europe. But I think even if you can develop algorithms that are very sensitive, and can find certain cases that are clearly normal and don't need to be in the workflow, that's, that could be a, a, have an effect on the workforce, at least in that small area. Absolutely, and we have you know, conclusive proof about in, in terms of negatives. Um, so yes, I absolutely could, couldn't agree with you more. And to address a popular panelist, uh, sorry, a YouTube viewer's comment, um, given that only one algorithm currently has Medicare Medicaid reimbursement, I believe they're referring to uh, VizAI's recent CMS approval, um, and it is not entirely clear who will be paying for AI products, uh, this person is curious where the VC folks and others here see the income coming for AI. And I think this definitely also touches on another point that I would love to also hear some opinions about, which is how much does CMS's approval of this AI impact your views on investment? Um, does it set a very important precedent uh, and will it push more work in this space? So uh, I, I can make a comment on that. So uh, there was a lot of hype around the Viz.ai reimbursement, but I think that in my opinion, that's a very rare situation where you have a unique clinical uh, situation. You had incredible evidence that it was affecting outcome because time is brain in the setting of stroke. Uh, so I, I give Viz AI a lot of credit for uh, accomplishing that, but it's been accomplished through a very special mechanism, which is uh, really complicated to explain, uh, but has to do with the hospital uh, uh, bundled payment for a given episode of care. 
and the ability to accommodate innovations that may happen so that you don't just cap the payment and don't allow innovation in that area. So you supplement it for a short, the payment for a short period of time, and ultimately that gets built back into the bundle. I don't think there are very many uh, other algorithms that are in that same situation. I, I can't think of a, an analogous clinical situation, honestly, that would fit the same criteria. So then you go to the professional fee, which is what goes to the radiologist. And that's where I think it's really difficult to imagine changes there, just given the reimbursement climate and the fact that uh, a lot of the activities that AI is supposed to perform is already baked in. The last point I would make is that there's kind of a contradiction between um, how AI is sold, which is, we were just talking about this workflow, we're trying to make it more efficient. So it takes radiologists less time to interpret a case versus the argument I think you'd have to make to, to, um, to get a professional fee reimbursement, a supplement of some kind for using AI, which would mean that it's taking more time and more effort when you use AI versus less. So you have to solve that paradox, I think, to get anywhere close to reimbursement for these technologies. I kind of take issue with the, the question a little just because it depends on what you define as AI, right? My, my hot take is always that the best, the most successful AI in healthcare company in history is Nuance. Because at one point, speech to text was considered AI. If you look at the original Dartmouth paper, uh, and then we've solved it. And like all things AI, we move the goalposts and we're like, no, no, that's just software now. Um, Heartflow, uh, I think a couple of the investors here, right? That's been reimbursed. Uh, Digital Diagnostics has done the same for diabetic retinopathy screening. Um, you know, even if you look at Olive.ai, RPA over, you know, the medical uh, clinical record and claims management, there's a lot of this stuff. And it's just like, you know, what's, what's real AI? Like, so. I, I remember the days when if then rules were AI, that was a <laughs> so, long time ago. Yeah. So, so it's like AI by definition is a thing that doesn't get reimbursed. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I just want to echo um, Nina's comment about understanding the context you're operating. And I think Sarah alludes to this, that the practice for mammograms in the UK is to have two readers. And so that sort of sets you up for success. Um, the other thing that's happening to radiology is actually acquisitions. This is the biggest threat, actually, more than AI, that every radiology practice has been bought by VC. And we know if we look at sort of like the dialysis centers that have been purchased by VC, they start to run very differently, you know, and, and so maybe those, some of these AI systems will be purchased because the, the owner of the, you know, the enterprise says, I need more studies read. And I believe this is going to do something for me. So I, you know, um, I personally see that the same VCs who are investing in some of these AI companies are the ones who are going to do the acquisitions for the radiology practices. And then you can actually control what you deploy. And in this case, it wouldn't be matter much what the radiologist thinks in my opinion, but Nina can oppose this. The other side of things is on population health. And I love the work and, and you know, I really have to emphasize that even in this space, it's better if you approach it from a long-term relationship. Now that may be difficult, especially when you have the chance to like make it quick and come in and leave. But if you think about sort of like breast, uh, you know, breast cancer is very, very political, at least in the US. And, you know, they, but if you look at something like uh, screening, uh, that hasn't really evolved. And you know, if you look at something like the terracruzic models for you know breast cancer uh, risk predictions, they work very poorly for some populations like Black women. You know, these are areas where we are seeing AI truly can come up with better metrics and better uh, you know. Uh, indicators actually that are much, you know, when they're bad, they're really bad, but it, it's a space that we're starting to see quite a lot of work, you know, come in. For example, you know, the work by Ziad and Payne and, you know, knee radiographs and those things start to change, you know, like the outcome. And so I believe this is going to be more of a population uh, health. And, uh, you know, I still keep going back to 2020 as people have started to see how populations, specific populations are affected by disparities, there will be more in investments in these areas. And so you may not be necessarily acquired by a VC company, but you may provide the tooling that allows 
uh, researchers or other hospitals to meet their you know population health goals and and that's a big i find that area of ai actually very exciting because it's starting to show us things that maybe as radiologists we don't see and everything right now is under threat the gfr is under threat you know, the pulse ox is under threat. So there's all these things that have to be developed for new metrics and new ways of data capture that AI, you know, just this process of thinking about AI allows us to look at. So, you know, the cake is big, but I think we also have to kind of widen our eyes uh, with how we are approaching this. I, I do have one comment about, um, about what Judy, you said in the first thing, um, and, and it's kind of, also what you're talking about in the second. And I think there's a couple stereotypes out there that, that two things, one um, venture capitalism investment in a group does not mean that they're automatically commoditizing that group. Uh, some do, and, and I've been in one, uh, I lived through that. And I actually quit without another job because of it. Um, but, but it doesn't mean that all groups are that way. Uh, and I would judge the groups based on what they're actually doing and what their outcomes are. And, and consolidation is actually different than commoditization. So, so in my current practice, we, we are funded by venture capitalists. Um, we are, and we were also funded by radiologists and, and physicians, but we have venture capitalist funding. Um, and, and like I said, I was in another, what I'll call a company, not so much a practice before in radiology that was also funded by venture capitalists and they told me what to do. Uh, and I quit my role as medical director because of it. And, and I quit my job because of it. Those fail. They will always fail because business people who are trying to skim money off the top will never succeed in healthcare. And, and ultimately, if you have venture capital and money um, and you have access to money, but that is allowed to be used by the physicians to do the right things, then consolidation can be a great thing and it doesn't have to be commoditization. So, so I, I like to separate those and just make that point. Yeah. I, I did want to go back to the, the original question about CMS's approval of this. Um, you know, I, I do think it is somewhat helpful. It is positive to see CMS acknowledging AI in AI imaging technology and its associated health economic evidence. I agree with Kurt, it's a, it's a, it's a very limited scope, right? Um, and in a very compelling use case. Um, and the NTAP program is, um, is only awarded if, if DRG bundles are not sufficient to cover the incremental service. But, um, you know, I think it is interesting. We've seen more um, information come out of the federal government that they're trying to align um, incentives between the FDA and, and CMS for, for coverage for some new, uh, for breakthrough devices, right? Um, and so if, if AI products are able to get that designation, this might be a nice start for them. Um, you know, granted, Viz and, and other products like this still don't have a lot of coverage from commercial payers. Um, so in my mind, back to the question that came in from the audience, how can, how can clinical AI products get income? I think you know, there are, there are a few ways. One is you develop a, a ton of evidence like biz and, and you have a compelling use case, but the other is you, you help align incentives for hospitals and payers and you, you help get rid of ineffective spending and you help more of a shift to value-based care. And I think that could be a really compelling use case for artificial intelligence. And it's where, um, frankly, you know, I, I'm spending a lot more of my time looking at companies that can help that transition. Mm -hmm. And Amir, that's a really good point. I think we are, even, even though it's a small use case for, for the NTAP perhaps, um, I, I, though I do know other people applying, uh, there is data that shows uh, Viz has now gotten a hundred more hospitals to sign up for their product because of it. And that's just since the time from October till now, uh, which is pretty impressive. Now it only lasts three years and it only works in certain instances in patients if the DRG isn't enough. So they have to prove their value. Ultimately, that's where it's gonna be. It's gonna be proving their value and proving their value to the hospital means probably bringing more money to the hospital, keeping patients in the system, decreasing length of stay, improving outcomes. It has to do all of those things. And what you mentioned was the new Medicare coverage of innovative technology, the MCIT, which is a new program 
that is not um, related necessarily just to the, the DRG and limited by that. It's the, if you get an FDA designation of a breakthrough technology, then from that day you get that designation, you have four years where you have national coverage from CMS for your product. And again, it's, it's temporary, four years is a lot and you could get a lot of people to just like visit a few months, got a hundred people to sign up. You could probably get a lot of people to sign up. Ultimately, you need to prove your value on your own. I mean, it is fantastic though, in terms of staging and crossing that valley of death, right? So to be able to separate clinical utility from safety uh, is, is a super, super helpful thing to do to actually stay alive long enough to prove that clinical utility case out. It's Looking been it one up. of the biggest challenges for med tech for years now, right? So we've, we've shepherded several companies through that over the years and it's hard enough to summit Everest right, and prove safety and efficacy on something that's fundamentally new. And based on reimbursement, if it's fundamentally new, it's likely not reimbursed. And, and what is so challenging is once you get to the peak of your first Everest, you realize you're only at base camp for coverage, right? And that process in one of our companies ended up taking, and it was, it was 14 years from start to finish. So this is a promising development. It's been a long time coming. Um, hopefully it gets some traction. You know, we tend, to, um, we tend to start with the clinical value proposition, right? To, to, the, to the patients in particular, we start there. So better health outcomes um, and ideally for fewer dollars invested. And then working backward through the reimbursement um, all the way back, right? So again, if a payer had full knowledge, what would they need to say, this is a good, th this is a good value, it's a good investment of these dollars. And there are, there, are, there are times when that lines up, but unfortunately there are a lot of times when it doesn't line up. And what I would just observe, uh, and maybe make me unpopular in this panel is, uh, I, I love AI. I, 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 I live it. I breathe it. I, I loved it when I was a kid. I left tech, went into healthcare, and then came back when it got interesting, which is how Chair and I met. Um, but to what Francisco said, uh, what we call AI, I mean, this is, this is software and engineering. We have some new capabilities, but for anybody who's been building companies or investing you know, through the 90s, the 2000s, the 2010s, that bar is always changing. The reimbursement's not going to change because it's AI. You got to find those applications, application by application, where it's better healthcare outcomes delivered uh, for ideally fewer dollars invested. And just a quick point, Sharon, that if you take a look at the list of the FDA cleared algorithms so far, which is growing, and try to make an intersection with who would qualify for breakthrough device status in that list. Or, you know, uh, I, I'm sure many of us are aware of other startups that are seeking that breakthrough device status, but they're somewhat different than the list of AI applications that we generally think about that have been cleared today. So um, how you kind of square that, um, it's gonna result in potentially a change in the market and where people are maybe gonna be more ambitious and pursuing more breakthrough type technologies that have a clear ROI. Um, we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's four criteria or five uh, that the device has to provide a more effective treatment or diagnosis of a life threatening or irreversibly debilitating human disease or condition. That's number one. And then beyond that, it, um, it has to not already have something that is approved and be a significant over advantage over what is the alternative. Uh, and then the, the device has to be in the best care of patients. So think of those things. And number two is the toughest there because many of the currently cleared algorithms are based on predicate devices. So by definition, there already is technology that's similar. So there's kind of a catch 22 there. Yeah. 
So that's really related to the audience question. Uh, what is your take on F the FDA's approach to digital health and AI? How rapidly will they evolve to that quote unquote modern practices? I know they did put out that whole like public community discussion, uh, supporting algorithms and these modern practices that support algorithms and software in healthcare, especially the, the move and maybe shift towards, uh, maybe we should call it new AI, I don't know. <laughs> Cause I know AI right. has rules, uh, but AI that maybe has these models that constantly update uh, where the FDA would pref maybe prefer models that do not can have frozen weights, right? Um, yeah, and, and speaking of AI, it appears my AI camera prefers to be blurry. So apologies for that, um, but please answer the question. So limitations of AI. <laughs> I, I think where the FDA is right now is you can, you can take a AI algorithm and they will clear it. They'll actually clear up to four algorithms at a time, um, but it's cleared at one point in time. It's frozen. It's not a machine learning because you can't learn. Uh, and you can only do four. I mean, there's now vendors out there. This wasn't an issue before, but there's vendors out there now that for a chest X-ray have 124 different findings for one combined product. And if they had to divide that by four, it would take them years um, and a lot of money. It's about $30,000 and maybe four years to get a certification or, or four, I'm sorry, four months to get a certification for each one. That would be very expensive. So, so that's one area that needs to be evaluated. And the other one is how do you get it so that you're not validating the algorithm at one point in time, but you're validating maybe the practices of the vendor that creates it so that you know that that vendor is certified for quality and there's national guidelines for that. Uh, we in the US haven't really accepted all of those yet, but there, there was when, when Scott Gottlieb left the, the FDA as commissioner, one of the things he implemented was this pre-certification program. That program is trying to go down this pathway of how do we learn how to certify a vendor and their quality capabilities so that they can oversee the product as it changes over time. And I think that's really the right direction, but we're still very early on that. We're just, I think they're just getting into beta um, beta evaluations. I, I think that uh, the FDA is in a tough spot, so it's it's hard to critique. Uh, they just we have so much good technology, potentially valuable technology, uh, that requires clearances, and yet you also have to have safety in mind. So obviously, dealing with that trade off is difficult. I think the framework that they came up with for these uh, technologies that can evolve over time is a good framework, but the devil is in the detail. So how, how actually do you determine that an organization is ready? That's a hard problem to solve. Um, and then more recently, there was an announcement, and I don't have the details on the tip of my tongue, but that they were really opening it up and saying that certain classes of devices didn't require clearance at all, at least temporarily. That seems to me unwise, but... Uh, it's unclear how, how sustained that's going to be. I feel like the details were there. There were no details and it was yeah. open game. Yeah. And everybody that Saturday morning was putting together a task force to <laughs> launch everything until it was frozen. Right. So uh, we'll see if that was a, that was a real uh, uh, FDA guidance or just a, kind of a shot over the bow from the outgoing administration. <laughs> Well, we are nearing the top of the hour. Uh, I guess I'd love to go around and ask everyone what areas you wish to see greater traction in over the next 10 years. Starting with Amir. Oh boy, okay. You could also pass the torch if this was too quick. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Um, so in 10 years, what areas do I wish to see greater traction in? Okay. Um, well, I think it's, it's an area that, that I mentioned before, which is, um, more of a, a move away from like fee for service models and, and moving toward more, um, pay for performance, uh, pay for quality. Um, and, and it's an area that we think about a lot, um, where, where you align everyone's interests and, and you do what's best for the patient. Um, so, so on the, on the clinical side, that can take the form of better diagnostics. 
uh, that help inform a care journey and, and inform better treatments. Um, and on healthcare services side, um, you know, you think about ways to, to get sort of the right, the right care at the right time and the right side of service, right? Um, so, so in addition, you know, I think it's kind of all encompassing, right? It's, it's better life science tools um, in, in each specialty, um, but it's also, it also cuts kind of across healthcare services, healthcare software. So I think, you know, the, what I'm hopeful of in 10 years is that there's just more, more value-based and alternative quality contracts. Um, and I think if, if that is the case, a lot of, um, a lot of life science and, and healthcare services will, will be in a better spot too. Awesome. Thank you. Sarah? Say that for me, what I'd like to see are AI solutions really starting to make an impact on healthcare in the developing world. Um, so my focus would very much be on inclusion and how can we start supporting women in Africa, for example, where they have some rate, they have some mammography machines and, you know, one reader in um, Kenya, for example. So that seems to be a problem that we could really help solve. That is a great vision. Kevin? If I could solve one problem in 10 years, it would be to cut the cost of drug development in half or two thirds without compromising safety and efficacy one whit. I think it's, it's inefficient what we currently do and especially with better data, better analytics, better predictive analytics, uh, better cross tabulating of results across different trials, better understandings of the biologies, we should be able to reduce the cost for a new molecule from several billion dollars down to several hundred million dollars. And I think that could have just a profound impact on, on global health and global equity. All right, I'll check in in a decade, okay? 10X. Uh, you can. <laughs> um, Nina? So I, I have actually been espousing this vision to my practice um, and thinking about it quite a bit. Maybe it's not 10 years, maybe for me it's more five, but I, I really think we need to be moving to, toward a cloud native technology as our baseline, um, not packs, not on the ground, not in prem, not in silo information, but information that's available so that we can actually drive outcomes and drive workflows. And instead of doing what we're doing now, which is getting experts together and saying, what do they think is the best thing to do? Let's figure out what's the best thing to do that is data-driven. I love it. Kurt? Yeah, this is a fun topic. I have a, a couple of ideas. So one, uh, I would love to see someone uh, build, combine computer vision with text generation and create a kind of uh, e-resident. Uh, so in academics, we have human uh, trainees to do this. They look at the images, they preview them, they create draft reports. That saves us a lot of time. Uh, and yet in private practice, that's often not available. So, but the productivity advantage is huge. So that would be an area where there'd be a, a major ROI for AI. Another one, and this is not so much an AI issue, but just patient mediated data sharing. So the idea that the patient should sneaker net a DVD from one place to another, incurring lots of costs at each end in order to get images from point A to point B in this world is, is kind of insane. And uh, it seems like there's room for disruption there with some just even text messaging or you know, some other very simple method that would give, allow a patient to give approval for those kinds of transfers and make them happen. And then the last one, and we talked about the issue of generalizability and we've got these algorithms out there. So when uh, a vendor approaches a customer and says, we have this algorithm that does this and here's the ROC area or what have you, I think there's still, uh, the customers are still somewhat skeptical and will, in order to be comfortable, I know I as a customer will wanna see some ability to analyze the performance of that algorithm over time. So the notion of AI analytics, how do I track what my algorithm is doing over time and uh, assure that the performance is, is holding up. So those kinds of tools I think will be very important too. So the first one, I hope uh, OpenAI gives you access to Dolly <laughs> so yes. that you can play with their 
their uh, right. text and image generation. That'd be really cool to see see the medical angle on that. Kurt, I was going to ask if you came up with the 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 need for um, an e resident after I graduated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we love our human residents. We wouldn't want to replace them at all. But I know they're just there's there's a shortage of them. <laughs> It's because he misses you. It'd be modeled after you. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Judy, Judy, what's your vision? We missed hearing from you. So, um, Sarah, you're my nemesis because first of all, I'm from Kenya. And this week I actually started a new job um, where with the National Institutes for Health, uh, Fogarty Institute uh, for Harnessing Data Science. Uh, for healthcare in Africa. So, which is, uh, you know, as someone who's a very late immigrant and I've worked a lot in global health. Um, I think my tenure vision is commoditization and democratization of AI as just another tool because that, when you do that, you know, and that's something that Sanford Group has been, done very well by just releasing data sets, you really equalize the skills. And at that point, you're free to focus on problems that really make a difference. So just this week, you know, I had my, you know, one of my colleagues who, you know, I worked with earlier on say, look, we have all this data and I still cannot tell you when the viral load is changing for a patient so that I can order the next test. You know, the, the screening will know it won't be every year. It has to be personalized. Maybe because you tell me that my risk of breast cancer is A, B, C, D, and it's this type of cancer. And that may even just give me calm to wait for the next year of screening. And so I see, uh, not the approach that, you know, that there are no doctors in Africa that, you know, you'd rather, because I think that's a really myopic, feel, you know, approach, but democratizing AI just allows anyone to use, you know, AI tools. So that's what I'm excited about. And last but not least, Francisco. I'm with going last on a panel of smart people as they take all of your uh, uh, thoughts. I'll go, back. I'll go after you and be, be worse. So, <laughs> go for it. Yeah, so, okay, rather than rephrase other people, I'll try to think of a new one on the spot. But I think um, one thing I think about a lot from an academic perspective is um, a, a merging of imaging with biological signal. Uh, radio genomics is kind of like a, a stab at that, but I think there's so much more. And I, you know, I've gotten into an argument with um, uh, Mustafa Ronaghi of Illumina, who says he thinks all imaging at the submillimeter level resolution will go by the wayside because of sequencing. That's his firm belief in Illumina's 10 year trajectory. Um, and I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. There, there's different signal here. And so I think there's so much more to morphology and anatomy that we can get from the images uh, that could give us sort of fundamental biological signal uh, beyond just functional imaging. And so we see a lot of research in that, but I'm really excited to, to see what that brings in the next 10 years. Fantastic, thank you. And I would like to see radically more data sharing, uh, especially without sacrificing privacy uh, using differentially private models, for example, to generate synthetic data. I don't know but something that would not sacrifice privacy and would give us a lot more data to work with in terms of data access. And this could mean for startups, also for academic institutions, everyone. And with that, that's a wrap. Thank you so much all panelists for joining and thank you audience for tuning into this, uh, to this episode. Um, please subscribe to us and follow us on Twitter. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>